Thank you uh, all for being here, and it's a great honor to be the first speaker at this great event. I'm absolutely honored. And before I go on to read from and talk about my novel, You're Not Dead, uh, I would like to thank, on behalf of all the Garn authors who are here, Denny Taylor. Denny takes a very hands-on and caring approach, not just to Garn's books, but to their authors. So if I'm delighted with my cover design, as I am, and if I was very pleased about the suggestions regarding sub-editing, which I was, that comes down to Denny and those who sail with her. So our profound thanks. So, thank you. Uh, I wrote a draft of this novel in 2009, having spent the new year in Death Valley, California. I can recommend it. Um, desert always exerts a profound effect, because in one way, of course, it takes away all the signposts, takes away civilization, but also insists absolutely on the primacy of place. So I'll just read a little paragraph uh, about, which comes out of that experience in Death Valley. Badwater is the navel of Death Valley. It is also the lowest point in the Western Hemisphere, and those giant letters high on the mountainside say sea level. Is that mountain near or far? Impossible to tell. Perspective just mopped its brow, gave up the ghost, and trudged off to Nevada. Meanwhile, the person walking effortfully towards you, glimpsed and then unglimpsed through heat haze in mirages of water, is tiny. Then suddenly, right there in your face, gasping hot breath. What happened to the in-between of distance? Drained, like the gallon of water needed for drinking as an absolute minimum each day. Here, the floor of the desert is not rock or sand, but salt, mile upon mile of salt. Walking in bad water for a mere half hour may or may not shrivel the soles of men, but it devours the soles of shoes. That packed salt loves to eat rubber. <laughs> so I just wanted to write something about this amazing place before it faded. Um, uh, and while the strangeness of it all was still vivid to me, to my intense surprise, once I started writing, characters began to materialize, walk towards me, argue with each other, fall in and out of love. A sense of magic took me over and then became the theme of the book. So my hero, Miles, is a young university teacher on the trail of a very rare book from the Victorian period, Transmutations, which claims to teach the art of magic. He tracks down the last single remaining copy in the world and becomes obsessed. This book has a life of its own, and mysteriously, its words change every time he reads it. By way of the book, Miles is now becoming a magician, able to alter events by mind control, travel through photographs to the scene in the photo, though he's not always able to get back. Although I had a sense of how the novel would end, I never knew for sure when starting any given chapter where it would take me. And so the settings of the book, Death Valley, London, New York, Cairo, are places I've been and anchors, therefore, but also triggers to meditation on fiction itself, because in one sense, all books change their words when they're reread, not just transmutations. Rewriting the book rather savagely for publication this year, having written its sequel uh, in the interim, because this is the first of a trilogy, the Midnight Books, was like returning to a house made of dreams in order belatedly to put real foundations in. The magical uncertainty of the writing process makes this author feel terribly vulnerable. I had no idea this would be the case, but it's something that I sense will be understood by other writers who are here tonight. In my day job, as noted, uh, I'm head of a college in Cambridge, Homerton. I'm deputy vice chancellor of the university. I've published literary criticism. I've done things for the BBC. While all of these activities have the potential to put me in situations where I could be exposed or vulnerable in one way or another, and I try and minimize the risk of that by the exercise of professionalism, not to mention low cunning. But the potential for exposure and vulnerability there is as nothing compared to what I found that writing fiction opened up in me. Whether this is good for one or bad for one or both, I don't know. 
One influence is an influence that goes right back to my childhood reading, Ray Bradbury. And reading other Ghan authors, I was struck by his recurring presence in different books, in different ways. And of course, one of his greatest books is a fantasy novel whose title comes from Macbeth, and which is inscribed in the highly magical cufflinks that I'm wearing for this evening's talk. So my left wrist reads, by the pricking of my thumbs, the right one, something wicked this way comes. <laughs> so Miles is pursued by forces of wickedness from beyond the grave, forces who want to prize his book from him. As he begins to abandon academia for magic, he's drawn into a circle of necromancers, none of whom can be wholly trusted. In this scene, he takes Laura Winthrop, beautiful, unhinged, dipsomaniac, utterly occult, to lunch on campus. It is August, and they are the only customers in the cafe. Miles fears that she may be after his book, which sits, as always, in his inside pocket, and which, as always, is developing a life of its own. It was at this point that he felt heat across his ribs, so powerful that he almost expected to see smoke pour from his clothing. Ectopic heartbeats made him feel as if the book in his pocket was shocking him electrically, or vibrating like the cell phones that it was rumored had been invented, but which governments worldwide held back from general issue for reasons so far unexplained. Excusing himself, he walked stiffly but at speed along the dotted line that marked the floor between the tables until he came to the sign of a matchstick man without features, legs akimbo, high on a purple door. Entering, he read above the sink the instruction, now wash your hands, and did so scrupulously and immediately, drying them with even more care and pulling spare tissues from the box fixed to the wall. Only then did he slip into a cubicle opening the door and then locking it behind him with tissue-swathed fingers before removing from his inner jacket pocket and inspecting the book that must retain its pristine state. Leaning with his back to the door of his enclosure, he read the opening words of a chapter he had no prior recollection of reading. It sounded a warning. Quote, now is the moment when friend may all unknowing no longer be so and worse, when strangers may be drawn, even against their better judgment, even against their knowledge. Miles's heart lurched. It was as if the book's words were now more than words, with a script for an inner voice to play back to him, filling his eyes and ears with an amplified warning of danger. But could Laura Winthrop really be that dangerous? Strange, yes. In a strangeness, beautiful, but dangerous? He calmed himself and prepared to reread those last lines, but of course they had changed again. Quote, nor is the obvious enemy, be he thief in the night or accuser by day, the worst opponent of the adept. His magical powers may be led from their true and purposeful path by a purported friend, a second person now possessed for a season or a moment by the dark mind of a third. Fear the opponent who works through the friend. The rest of the page remained blank. Miles stayed rooted, spooked, mind whirling in a gents in Greater London. Slowly and with infinite care, he replaced the book in his inner jacket pocket, collected himself, and after gazing for a moment into the unused toilet bowl as if terrible danger might lurk there or come bubbling up the U-bend, walked once again to the sink, washing this time not just his hands but his face and in cold water. As he bent towards the sink to turn on the tap, the words, now wash your hands, changed, unseen by him, to stark Gothic script that read, now watch your back. So uh, as you'll have picked up from that uh, little passage, one of the running gags in my trilogy is that cell phones haven't been invented yet. They finally go on sale to the public in 2017, in volume three. And um, the first batch to hit the UK is sent over by Silicon Valley to arrive at Ringtones, uh, a store in London's Covent Garden. But unfortunately, they sent the wrong batch. They sent the batch, which was for the eyes of the Pentagon only. 
Taking photos of people with these cell phones allows you to view their genetic, medical, and sexual history. Don't worry, Miles is on the case. But actually, do worry, because they'll probably invent those phones very soon. So, as you will have gathered, my fiction is idiosyncratic. It also draws enthusiastically on all the genre that I was told to stay away from when I was a kid. Horror movies, the raucous innuendo of the carry-on films, thrillers, noir, pop culture. So in looking for a final piece to read to you, it suddenly dawned on me that most of my favorite passages in the novel are obscene. Um, <laughs> so I decided I couldn't read them. They're not even obscene in the same way, but anyway, there we are. So I thought, no, instead, I won't do that. As we're in New York City, I'm going to read a final passage which is set in Manhattan, except it isn't. Miles and his girlfriend, Becky, have learned how to travel through photographs into the scenes that they depict and have learned to dream together the same dream. In this case, a dream of New York City. But there are also hints that magic can be dangerous because of its manipulation of reality and the high wire act that Miles is now beginning to take to extremes. So we are and we are not in New York City. The more we do this, he thought, the more we hallucinate New York, the more like real life it becomes. This is giving me goosebumps. We could die, each thought separately. I could die, or you could. If you were killed in the dream, I might have to die myself before I got you back, if there's an afterlife, if I got you back. They walked on, silent for a while, both thinking their thoughts, some coinciding, some divergent, moving forward through the bright and noisy day. The hot dog seller with his bottles of Poland Spring, the students, the tourists, a team of morose-looking clowns handing out flyers, choppers cawing overhead, intestinal subway grumbling and shuddering, the Moloch maze retinal noise of New York City. Behind them, and they did not see this, partly because there was so much less to see, the street pageant faded into insubstantiality, first sound and then faces and then color draining out of it. As they moved forwards, the street died backwards. Behind them and unseen, everything fell away to nothing. Here a lonesome hot dog, without benefit of roll or mustard, moved north towards a fading open mouth. There a hand, about to pick a pocket, evaporated into dotted lines, then air, while the evanescent pocket jogged away, itself dissolving in the measureless void. <coughs> Behind them, buildings wobbled, sighed back into architects' pencil lines, drawn by the draftsmen of not today. The dream's over, people. Go home. There's nothing left to see. There's nothing left to dream. Out of the corner of one troubled eye, Becky slightly saw backward into the great wave of zero that streamed out behind them. Unable to bear the thought of nothing, she erased it from her mind. Her memory filled it with something. Our lives now, she thought, are a walk along a tightrope. Perhaps still, there is some wiser, broader nature that can encompass it all, can make it mean right and true things, from the outermost sidereal to the steep reeling inside, then all the way down to the deep inside reel. Perhaps. Which myth was it that pictured the world on a giant turtle's back, on the back of another, then another, then another turtle? So comforting, the sense of spinning cosmic plates never dropped and magically balancing. How loose those plates seem to me now. But it all ends happily, of course. That's the magic of fiction, which distracts us from our mortality, shows us our dreams, shows us what is, but also what could be if we learn to dream harder. Do we believe in magic? Oh, yes. <laughs>